Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Again, we're in the middle of our Gematria series, and um, this is lecture number 15, but we are up to the number 13, um, which is Shlosha Aser. So, let's begin. 12 is the uh, number of maximal, what we call maximal differentiation. It is a number of lines that border a cube, and according to our rabbis, all reality. Again, we talked about it a bit last week. In fact, the twelves are all connected. In the center is the thirteenth. Thirteen is the number that bonds multiplicity into oneness. An example would be the twelve tribes of Israel that are bonded into their father Yaakov, and he is the thirteenth. The meaning of the number thirteen is the bonding of many into one. So, thirteen is another way of, to expo, of expressing what we call the unity of God. Jews look to make many into one, while Gentiles look to make one into many. Now this is exemplified with the preeminent prayers of the Jews, again the Shema, which speaks of the God being one and one only, while the Gentiles' preeminent theology is the Trinity, in which they make God into three gods. And this is why the Gentiles have a superstition that the number 13 is bad whereas Jews see the number as very good. So the number 13 is among the holiest numbers in Judaism because it is closely associated with God. The world and everything around us is just an extension of God. God gave us the human body with all of his responses in order to give us an intimate insight into God himself and his creation. If we understand what it means to hear we can understand what it means to declare God's oneness. What does that mean? Hearing is a sense which requires us to assemble the sounds from another person into a cohesive picture. So we would say that hearing is forming of disparate parts into a single idea or picture. Literally, we make many sounds into one idea. So the Shema, which we translate as hearing, literally means the gathering of many and making them into one. The goal of the Shema should be Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad that God is one and His name is one. The last word of the Shema is the word Echad meaning one. Again, Echad has a gematria, a numerical value of 13. The word Ahava which means love also has a numerical value of 13. So our rabbis teach us that when two words have the same numeric value, then the essential meaning of the two words is basically the same. We have a belief that when two people love each other, then 13 plus 13, ava plus ava, equals 30, 26, and they connect to the holiest name of God, of mercy, again, the name we don't mention. These sentiments anchor the eternal love between God and the nation of Israel. The wide-ranging impact of this relationship is prominently symbolized in the number 13. Now the Rambam lists what we call the 13 principles of faith, which we understand are the minimum requirements of Jewish belief. They have been condensed in what we call the animamans, which mean I believe statements. They are, one, God exists. He is one and unique. He is incorporeal. He is eternal, and prayer is to be directed to him, to God alone, and to no other. The words of the prophets are true. Moses' prophecies are true, and Moses was the greatest of all the prophets. The written Torah and the oral Torah were all given to Moses on Mount Sinai. There will be no other Torah. God knows the thoughts and deeds of men. God will reward the good and punish the wicked. The Messiah, Mashiach, will come, and the dead will be resurrected, what we call Tchiat HaMetim. When Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Torah, God taught him the 13 attributes of divine mercy. Yud Gedmon Midas Tarachamim. They form a major, major part of prayers of Yom Kippur, which we repeat again and again many times. While we also say them in our morning and afternoon prayers, every day whenever Tachanun is, is uh, said. They are, the 13 are first, the word Hashem, 
who has compassion before the sin. Then the word Hashem is repeated again. Who has compassion after one has sinned. In fact, Moshe Rabbeinu asked God about why he was concerned. And God said, you'll need that one day. You'll be happy to say that. When they made the golden calf, Moshe Rabbeinu used this concept. Rachum means merciful, that mankind may not be distressed. Vachanun and gracious, if mankind is already is distressed. Erech slow to anger, again, which is major. That God, is, God does not punish us right away, but gives us a chance to do tshuva, to repent. Rav chesed, abundant in mercy. The emet and truth, nozer chesed la lafim, keeping mercy unto the thousands. No se avon, forgiving iniquity. No se pesha, forgiving transgression. No se chata, forgiving sins, venake, and pardoning. Again, 13 attributes of mercy. Now, a young boy who turns 13 becomes an adult, according to Jewish law. He is called a bar mitzvah. Again, one who accepts the laws, culpabilities. He is now culpable for all his actions. When a boy is born, he is given an evil inclination, what we call a yetzer hara. It is not until he turns 13 that he receives his yetzer tov, his good inclination. It's really very strange. A quick aside, if God wants us to be good, the Torah says very clearly the man was created ra min arav, evil from birth. So when we're born, even though the angel teaches us the Torah, the whole Torah in the, our mother's womb, when we're born, the angel touches us just below the nose, and again, the nose shaped like an upside down chin, and all of holiness, according to Kabbalah, enters through the nostrils. When man was created, it says, God blew in his nostrils, the breath of life. So God blew a part of himself into us, which gave us life. So, Kedusha, holiness, enters through the nostrils. And, before, and when we're born, as we leave the womb, the Yetzirah is standing right there. After the angel in the womb teaches us all the Torah, he touches us. And that's why we have that indentation just below our nose. And that makes us forget all the Torah that we've learned. And he's with us for the next 13 years. But the question becomes, why does God give us a good inclination when we're 13? If he wants us good, why not give us a good inclination when we're born? After all, people that are good are not usually as much fun. They don't get as wild and woolly, uh, a little more boring. Um, you know, people that are evil, they're out partying. And I mean, it's a whole different lifestyle. And so if God wants us good, why not first, in fact, the Catholic Church says, give me your children to the age of four, and they'll be devout Catholics for the rest of their life. So that makes an impression. So if God wants us good, why not give us the Yetzir Tov, the good inclination when we're born? And at age 13, after we become accustomed to being good, maybe a little nerdy, but still, we're in that groove, then give us a Yetzir an evil inclination, we might actually be able to say no to him. So why is it that God does this? Why does he first give us an evil inclination? And the answer is that God wants exactly what we want as parents. He wants to be relevant. And the way he does that is he creates a scenario. If we were born with a good inclination, we might actually be able, just out of habit, to live a decent life and feel we don't need God. But since we are born with an evil inclination, it's an uphill battle. And the only way that we can survive, the only way that we can go through that minefield that we call life, is by turning to God for help. And that's why he creates this scenario. I always say that if you have a child that goes to college, if you put enough money in his bank account for one year, you'll see him once a year. Put enough in for six months, you'll see him twice a year. Put enough in for a week, you'll see him 52 times that year. Put enough in for every day, you'll see him every day of the year. And that's one of the reasons why God had the man fall in the desert every day, because he wanted that relationship with the Jewish nation, with his children, just as we do. And that's the reason why, again, the Yetzirah is uh, there at birth, but the good inclination at age 13. Now, it's, what else is interesting is that the Mishnah, which is the first of the oral tradition, deals, the first mission deals with the law of the Shema in the evening. Again, the Jewish day begins at night. So this, concept, this connects with the 13-year-old boy. The first commandment that he as a Jewish man is culpable for, for is saying the evening Shema, 
and that's why this first mitzvah that he has to do is the first question, the first debate in the uh, Mishnah. Now, as a 13-year-old Jewish male, he now can be counted as one of the ten individuals in a minyan. If he is the tenth man, man to enter the synagogue, he amazingly has the power to bring the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, with him. There are 13 blessings of requests in the weekday Amida, the standing prayer, which again, the word tefillah, prayer, always designates the Shimon Esra we call the Amida. In the prayer Yishtabach, that separates one part of the, uh, the, the Psuke de Zimra, the praises of God with the blessings of the Shema, there are 13 praises of God. In the Brisa Rishma that we read before we begin the Psuke de Zimra, he talks about the 13 principles to the Torah's exorcist with which we expound on the Torah. Yosef's dream consisted of 11 stars, the sun, and the moon, 13. All that, all that, so the, all of them that would bow down to him, which came true when his family came down to Egypt and all bowed to him. On the last day of his life, Moses wrote 13 Torah scrolls, Sifrei Torah. But Salel was a 13 year old architect of the Mishkan. And there were 13 do, uh, donated materials that were used in the construction of the Mishkan. In the land of Israel, the Holy Temple became the permanent 13th spiritual, 13th spiritual religious center for the 12 tribes of Israel. In the temple, there were 13 boxes for placing the half shekel donation that everyone had to bring every year. The flour that was used for a mincha, for a meal offering, was sifted 13 times. In the second temple, there were 13 places where the people bowed down to God. And these 13 prostrations were opposite the 13 places where the Greeks had breached the latticework perimeter of the Temple Mount and which had been repaired by the Hashminoim when they conquered the, the uh, Jerusalem. In the allegory of Shir Hashirim, God says about his beloved people, like a rose among the thorns, so is my love among the, the daughters. Uh, means like the 13 petal of petals of a rose. So is Israel safeguarded by God through his 13 attributes of mercy that surround her. In our lunar calendar, there are 12 months. However, seven out of every 19 years are leap years, but we add an extra month called Adar Sheni, the second Adar. We add the 13th month so that our festivals will fall out in the proper season. Pesach always falls out in the spring, and Sukkot always occurs during the harvest season. Ptolemy, who was the Greek ruler who ruled in Alexandria, had the rabbis of that generation translate the Torah into Greek. It was the first translation of the Torah. He commissioned 72 elders to translate the Torah. He placed them, though, in 72 different rooms so that he could proof check their work. Miraculously, all 72 sages made the same 13 modifications in the text of the Hebrew Torah when they translated it into Greek. An example would be the first words of the Torah that, that translate literally, Bereshit bara elokim. Bereshit means in the beginning created God. So if you were to translate it literally, it sounds like Bereshit, whoever that is, was the one who created God. So what they did is they reversed it and, and translated it to say God created in the beginning. Just as a quick answer, why would God put his name third? And the answer is to teach us humility, that his name is not first for us to learn that. Thirteen Hashmonoims commanded the Jewish army that overthrew the Greeks. These thirteen courageous men enabled the Jewish people to preserve the oral tradition and its thirteen principles. There were thirteen covenants that were established in connection with circumcision. The word Brit, again meaning covenant, is mentioned by God 13 times where he introduces the idea of circumcision to Abram Avinu, to Abraham our father, corresponding to the 13 attributes of mercy. The concept of circumcision in Brit Mila is mentioned in exactly 13 psalms in Tehillim, in psalms. The gematria 
of the name Moshe is 345 plus the 13 attributes of mercy that God taught him when he was on the mountain is 358, the same gematria. The numerical value is the word Mashiach. Yishmael was 13 when he was circumcised. Yaakov fathered 12 sons and one daughter, 13. In the section concerning Eliezer, the servant of Abram, finding a wife for Yitzchak when he went to Lavan of Suel, Rivka's name appears 13 times. In Misbar Kutten, again, where we just drop zeros and bring numbers down to the lower amount, the, the Adam, we know, was 130 years old when he fathered Seth, Shase, 13. Yaakov was 130 years old when he stood in front of Paro when he came down to Egypt, again, 13. And Yocheba was 130 years old when she gave birth to Moshe Rabbeinu, 13. The total numbers of letters contained in a word reveal something about the word itself. So if you take the names Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the three fathers of Israel, Avraham Vino has five letters, Yitzhak four, Yaakov another four, have a total of 13 letters in their names. The mothers of Israel, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, three for Sarah, Rivka is four, Rachel is three, and Leah is three, 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 and four, again, 13, also have a total number of letters in their names of 13. 13 for the fathers of Israel and 13 for the mothers of Israel equal 26, which again is the holy name of God, of mercy, which we never erase or even say. Also, 13 can be broken down into 1 and 3. Only one of the mothers of Israel was fertile, Leah. The other three were barren and had to pray to God for children. Which again is an interesting aside, why did they have to pray for children? Leah was, hard to say the word hated, but she was, there was a, since she, Yaakov was duped into marrying her, the relationship was dubious, and therefore God had mercy on her and she gave birth without any difficulty. But again, the other three, God loves the prayers of the righteous. But the question really is, these were the most righteous of women. What do righteous women do but pray? And it's a great lesson that we learn from here. That even righteous women, when you really need something, when you really want something, you pray differently. And that's the key. So even righteous women that pray with great connection to God, God still wanted their deeper prayer. And that's like the blessing that we say for good health. We say it every day in the davening during the weekdays. And yet, when you're sick or someone in your family is sick, somehow we say it a little bit differently. And it's a great lesson for us to learn. May God continue to bless us with the lucky number 13. God bless and have a great Shabbat. Thank you for coming.